yeah. So for, first of all, welcome everybody here. It's a great pleasure. My name is Lucas. I'm the sixth year of medical school here. I, want, I am a OSP Harvard that went there in 2011. So it's a great pleasure for us here, for our alumni, to receive people from Boston. So we are welcoming here Numa, Numa Perez. So Numa, is a, he had his bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and computer science in uh, University of California, is that right? Yeah, in Berkeley. And then um, he had his uh, MD course, medical course there in Harvard Medical School. He finished this year. He came here for uh, an exchange program. He did a rotation here in trauma surgery here in our hospital, PS, I guess. And then he, he now, uh, he, he just got at uh, the trauma surgery in Massachusetts General Hospital. That is one of the greatest hospitals there in Boston and uh, in, in the United States. So that, that's, congratulations, Noma. It's a, it's a very, it's very good for us and it's a pleasure to have you here and to have your time, right? Because you're going to Boston tomorrow. So thank you, welcome, Noma. Um, well, thanks, thanks everyone for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak to you. Um, I'd love to, you know, I, I love my school uh, and, and uh, it's, it's great to, to tell you more about it and it'd be nice to see you guys all in Boston at some point. Um, I know that USP and Harvard have a very good relationship, very good relationship. And, and I've met a lot of the Brazilian students when they go up there. I, I've met them randomly in the gym and in, in events and stuff like that. Uh, and I know from their experience that it's, it's a very good opportunity. Uh, they all seem to enjoy it and Lucas can speak to that. Uh, they go for a year and, and you know, they, they get papers, they get their name on papers, they get great research experience. So um, yeah, I guess you know, Lucas wanted me to tell you just a little bit more about the structure of, of the medical school system in the United States. It's, it's, the United States system is, is different than probably the rest of the world. Um, I'm originally from El Salvador in Central America and my mom is a, is, a, is a doctor there. And so I know that the Salvadorian system is very similar to your guys' systems, very similar to the Cuban, the German system, but America is different. And so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about it. I'll also tell you about the, the four years of med school itself in, at Harvard. Uh, and then Lucas also wanted me to touch on the STEP exams. Uh, you guys may have heard about them, the USMLE STEP exams. Uh, right off the bat, I'll disband a, a misunderstanding that a lot of people have. Uh, and by the way, if you, if, you're, if you don't understand anything, just ask me, I'll, I'll say it in Portuguese. Uh, or my, my Portuguese, I speak Portuguese, it's more like that. Um, so the STEP exams are not for foreign students. They're for everyone. I have to take the STEP exam, so I'm gonna tell you what I did to study for the STEP exams. Everyone has to take it. Those are the exams that we take in order to have a medical license. So that's why when you guys come with your medical degree from here, you have to take those exams to get an American license, okay? So we're not targeting just foreigners and hitting them with nine hour exams and you know, hoping they fail. Um, <laughs> That's not the case. So I figured I'd start with this first slide, okay, just to kind of clarify how does the American system of med school work, right? So the first here, you know, this is your age, right? So you're a little kid and you're in kindergarten and then you do, I think you're talking about the school basic, I don't know, college, I don't know, high school, you know. So this is elementary school, you know. The, uh, after that, you go to junior high school or you go straight to high school, right? And then at 17 or 18 years old, you graduate, right? For you guys, if you want to go to medical school, you go to medical school at that point, at 18 or 19 or something like that. Not for us, okay? For us, medical school is a plan for the future. Dental school uh, is the same. Law school is the same. It's, these are plans for the future, you know? For the time being, you have to figure out what you want to go to the university for in order to prepare for these other schools. So this is what we call an undergraduate program. Okay? It's a four-year degree, and it's the same degree that you would do if what you want to do in life is engineering, or you want to go teach biology at school, or do you want to be a historian, or music, or whatever you want to do. right? So this is our, these are four-year degrees and you get a bachelor's degree. 
Ah, eu acho que vocês têm um término para isso, bachelorado, algo assim, bachelorado. Eu entendo. So with this degree, you know, I uh, I did mine in engineering, electrical engineering, and that's I could have gone and been an electrical engineer somewhere. Um, now, the, tri the, the caveat, the, the added requirement, if you're thinking of medical school, uh, is you have to take what we call pre-medicine courses, okay? So these are a set number of classes that you have to take. So there are, you know, two biology courses, two general chemistry, two organic chemistry, biochemistry, physics and stuff like that. There's a number of courses you have to take. So what usually happens is if you're thinking of medical school, you go to university and you get an undergraduate degree, you get a bachelor's degree in biology. Micro, microbiology, chemistry, something like that. The reason for that is that the classes of your degree are common with the pre-medicine courses, right? So it's easy, you don't have to do anything extra. For someone like me who does engineering, Engineering doesn't require biology, it doesn't require chemistry, so those are all extra courses for me. So I had to work a lot of the summer, my summer vacations, I had to stay at the university, kind of sticking some of those pre-medicine courses in so that I could finish them up. Okay, so that's the difference. And that's the same for someone that studies history. History doesn't require biology either, so you have to take these courses separately, okay? Um, so then you graduate. You graduate with a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering, and you want to go to med school, so you, do, you take at that point what's called the Medical College Admission Test, the MCAT. It's a national exam, it's just one exam for all universities, all medical schools. Um, it's like an eight hour test or something like that, seven hour written exam, and you will get a grade, okay? And then once you have that grade, you will apply to med school. Okay, and the things that are important for medical school application over there are your grades from your degree, specifically the grades from your pre-medicine courses, right? So it doesn't matter if you did great in engineering, right? If you did great in computer programming and signals and systems and this and that, but then you kind of didn't do too well in biology, chemistry, like they, they look at both grades. Um, they look at the grade from the medical college admission test. And then some schools more than others require certain things, or maybe they don't necessarily require them, they require them, but they pay a lot of attention to. So research. So if you want to apply to a university, to a medical school that has a big focus on research, so Harvard has a big focus on, on research, you want to do research here, okay? You want to do research, because they're, they're going to want to see that on their application, okay? Um, they're going to want to see volunteering opportunities. So that, you know, you worked at an emergency department as a volunteer and you were helping people around. They're going to want to see some leadership or community organizations. So what Lucas does, for example, Lucas is a leader in your guys' Luminaria de USP Harvard. Now, it's an experience that they want to see in curriculum vitae. Now, and so you put your application together and apply you get your interviews, and you go to med school, right? You get accepted. Now, med school over there is, is four years, so, and, and just to emphasize, so after that degree, a lot of people go do a, uh, uh, maestr a maestrado, depois eles fazem um PhD, ou você vai e faz escola de medicina, escola de lei, escola de odontologia, coisas assim. Now, for, for people like us, we're gonna go to med school. So, then you go to med school, and you have something like this. This is the, structure of medical school at Harvard, okay? My actual structure. Now this is changing this year to this, and I'll address this in a second, but this is what I went through. So it's four years of medical school. I, I already, the first two years for you guys are kind of the equivalent of my pre-medicine courses, right? All the basic stuff. So I go right into, and then the first year, the real big classes on first year are anatomy, real big important classes, um, physiology, right? So the anatomy and how are systems supposed to work under normal conditions. And then we do also a lot of other stuff. We do social medicine, medicina social, <coughs> genetica, uh, etica e profissionalismo de medicina. Fazemos immunologia, microbiologia, patologia. 
uh, class, uh, 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 basic classes, basic courses as well. Um, but again, the real heavy courses are physiology and anatomy. They're pretty, pretty tough courses. I guess immunology and microbiology, they're, they're also tough as well. Uh, these are blocks. So there, we, we take one class during the mornings um, and we do it for four weeks or five weeks and we kind of focus on that class for the morning time. A class in Harvard has some lecture time, so like this, you know, the, in an auditorium, it's a general lecture for everyone. Not necessarily required, they, they film them, so a lot of us, maybe we don't learn well in auditoriums because like I get distracted very easily. So I'd rather be at home and just kind of like in my pajamas and I just watch, you know, what I need to watch. Um, so that there's a part of that. And then there's what we call tutorials. Okay, so tutorials are small group meetings. 10 students, so my class is about 160 students. So these are 10 group, 10 people groups with one faculty, one doctor, okay? And then, so you go to, a, you have a general lecture in the morning uh, and then you go to a tutorial meeting and you use cases to address the material in class, okay? And a lot of the learning really comes from there because it's hard to ask questions in an auditorium and stuff, but there is where you, you have a doctor right there and you're asking them questions and they're specialists in this and then you guys are, are you know, talking about the cases working through it. So, so that's sort of the structure of every class, okay? Um, your grade at Harvard we take written exams for every class, uh, but we don't get a grade. You either pass or fail, okay? What you do for the first two years only, for the first two years, what you do get is an, uh, a written evaluation from this doctor in this small group meeting at the end of the course. And this is what counts way more than any other grade. Because a doctor will say, you know what? Numa did not seem very interested in the class. He didn't seem to study much. Every question I asked him, he just didn't, you know, he will write this. Or he will say, you know what, it was clear that Numa was reading at home. He came with, you know, good questions and, and participated and helped us, you know, right? So these things add up and they come into play here when we apply for residency. Those, uh, those evaluations, right? So that's the structure of first year. Second year, we focus on pathophysiology. So now we know the anatomy, we know the way things are supposed to work, and then we study the way things can go wrong. And that's really the big focus of second year. We do have uh, also longitudinal classes that happen in the afternoons. Um, and these are a lot of these um, pursuing, uh, so this is a research class Epidemiology, um, health policy, uh, politica e saúde, um, introduction to the profession is also, it's a longitudinal class. So it happens throughout the entire year in the afternoons. This course is a course that we go to the hospital and start talking to patients. As a first year student, no experience, we know nothing of medicine, but we just go to the hospital and take clinical interviews absolutely no idea what we're doing. But it's really just, just the thing to, to get rid of the fear of talking to a patient. You know, and you get used to talking to patients. Patients love it actually, you know, a lot of the times they're just sitting bored and they love to get, you know, uh, someone to help them spend their time. So it's, it's very fun. Same here, we have a, another uh, longitudinal course, it's Patient Doctor 2. Um, that goes through the whole year and it's sort of a little bit the same structure, but now you know a little bit more of medicine. So you should be able to start asking some more clinical questions of the patients and start trying to put together differential diagnoses. So again, just to prepare you for third year. At the end of second year, we take USMLE 1. Take step 1, okay? And I'll tell you what I did to study for that so that if you want to study for it and, and take it and, and go to the United States to do your residency, you can do that, okay? And then we start third year, which is sort of uh, what would be equivalent to your fifth year, but your fifth and, and sixth years are structured very differently than our third and fourth years, and you'll see, you'll see how here. So here we have nosos stagios, eh? 
we call them clerkships. And it's different in every school. And it's also slightly different. Uh, I will say one thing. In, in, in the United States, we're, we're fortunate in one way that the, the American Association of Medical Colleges, the AAMC, is very strict. So there, there is not the case where you go to one medical school, you're a good doctor, you go to another medical school, you are not at all, like you're awful and you are gonna kill people. That is not the case. I don't, I, you know, I don't care where you went to med school, if I know you went to med school, I know you learned the same thing that I learned because they're very strict. Law school, I'm the same. You go to one law school in, in the United States, you're a great lawyer, you go to another one, uh, not so much. It's just they're not as tight with regulations. You cannot, as a university, you can't just one day wake up and say, we want to have a med school. It's not that easy. And I think here in Brazil, you do have that variability. A lot of private schools, seems like, and a lot of those private schools, they don't have the standards that you guys here have. You, you're one of the best, if not the best, medical school in, in the country. So, so yeah, in, in the United States, it's it's... It's not like that, but there are differences in the way they structure their years. And there are also differences from hospital to hospital. So in third year, you spend the entire year at a hospital. For Harvard, we have three main hospitals, or four main hospitals that we can spend. And you're assigned to one hospital only. So we have Beth Israel Hospital. Uh, I, I know a lot of Brazilian uh, folks have done research at Beth Israel. Uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital, uh, Massachusetts General, and uh, Cambridge Health Alliance. Cambridge Health Alliance is more of a community hospital. Um, and then the other three are just big hospitals like, like HC, mas não são públicos. Então, a população de, a gente que você vai ver, os doentes, são um pouquinho diferentes. Nós temos hospitais públicos no Boston, que é muito similar a HC, mas é, chama Boston Medical Center. É o hospital associado com a Faculdade de Medicina de Boston University, que é outra Faculdade de Medicina de Boston que é muito legal também. I, I was assigned to Beth Israel. So at Beth Israel, you have four trimesters in, 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 the, in the year. So we do three months of medicine, Clinica Medica. Most of it is at the infirmer infirmeria, so on the floor, we call it in the wards, that's the floor, people that are admitted. We also do some outpatient medicine, so it would be maybe the equivalent of a um, poste de saúde, uma, uma clinica, no, no, poste de saúde, no, ambulatorio, é ambulatorio, eu guess. And we rotate through, we call it outpatient medicine, so outpatient and inpatient, right? Um, and you do a lot, you learn a lot of the actual medicine in, in that, those three months of clinical medicine. It's, these are great. We also do three months of surgery, okay? Um, we do three months in which we do six weeks of obstetrics and gynecology, and we do six weeks of pediatrics. If you're at Beth Israel and Brigham and Women's, both those hospitals don't have a pediatrics department, so you do your pediatrics rotation at Children's Hospital in Boston, which is also uh, affiliated to Harvard. If you're in Mass General, you do your rotation there because Mass General has pediatrics department. And then the last three months, you do one month of neurology, one month of uh, uh, psychiatry, and one month of radiology, right? So again, I already told you what we do in medicine. Medicine is we do some Inpatient, we do some outpatient, and then we do some electives as well. So if you're interested in endocrinology, then you go and spend a week with an endocrinologist. If you're interested in cardiology, you can do cardiology, dermatology, whatever. So those are the three months of medicine. For surgery, at my hospital, not the same at the other two, but at my hospital, we do one month. With a, main, with a primary team, a big team. So primary teams are teams like aparelo um, digestivo, uh, coloproctal, hepato pancreato biliar, cirurgia oncologica, 
those are big main teams and you'll spend a month with one of those teams mainly at the infirmary okay so notice I haven't said much about pronto socorro because we don't have much experience at pronto socorro some hospitals have we call it the, the ED, the emergency department have some time in the emergency department during surgery Beth Israel doesn't so I actually never really spend time at the emergency department at, at, in, in Boston so in your three months of surgery you do one month of uh, a primary team and then you do two weeks of trauma <coughs> trauma surgery. Now trauma surgery in the United States works as a consulting team um, so you are called to the emergency department by the emergency physicians. We have a complete different residency called emergency medicine for people that are going to work at the ED. Internal, internal medicine doctors don't spend time at the ED. They're also called by the emergency medicine doctors or you know if, if a patient comes in with a heart attack the emergency medicine doctor handles that and then admits the patient and then the internal medicine doctors take care of the patient in the infirmary. If a patient comes in with belly pain, emergency medicine doctor sees him. If he thinks it might be appendicitis or it might be cholecystitis, then he calls the trauma surgery team. Trauma and emergency surgery team. And then we come, we evaluate it. If it's something surgical, we take him, the patient in for surgery. And then we admit the patient to our infirmary, to our ward, and now it's our patient. Uh, if there's a trauma coming in, then immediately the trauma surgery team is, is called. At my hospitals, traumas are managed by both trauma surgery and emergency medicine together. So we do the A, B, C, D, E together. Each side has certain roles, but that's how we do it. So those, you do two weeks of that, two weeks. And as a student, when emergency medicine calls the trauma team and says we have somebody with belly pain, resident says is the patient like, really sick like is he dying or is he okay and if the patient's okay then he tells the student he says okay you go see the patient and then you go see the patient you get your history you do your exam you come back and you say I think it's appendicitis and then the resident goes and confirms and teaches you and stuff like that so that's how you that's your role as a student um, in the United States something that I've noticed after doing surgery here something that's a little bit different is when you operate on, when you're in the surgery uh, as a student, you, you, have, you do a little more. So you, you'll retract. You'll be involved in the surgery. You won't be all the way in the back. Not every time. Sometimes you will be all the way in the back, kind of just like trying to see what you can see. Uh, but a lot of the times you will be involved and you'll be retracting. You'll be cutting the sutures. You'll be tying sutures as well. And the surgeon will throw a stitch and say tie and you'll, you'll tie it up and you'll screw it up the first time the surgeon will ask you to do it better you'll practice at home and you'll get better at that so you do a little more uh, laparoscopic surgery or laparoscopic cholecystectomy um, you'll probably drive the camera you'll, you'll be holding the camera as a third year student um, there might be three other ports the surgeon might have one instrument and the resident who's learning from the surgeon might have the other two instruments. So the, the surgeon is kind of helping hold the liver up and telling the resident what to do and you're holding the camera. So you get a little more of a role to do. After open surgeries, particularly if you're motivated, if, you're, if you don't care because you, you know, you're not interested in surgery, you already know you want to be a dermatologist, so whatever, right? Uh, they won't force you, but if you want to, you, you'll, close, you'll close the incision, the skin. The, the, the aponeurosis é, é mais que todos os residentes, que é muito importante, <risos> não tem uma hérnia, não. Mas a pele você vai fechar, e para praticar e sentir que você faz algo, né? Você ficou parado três, quatro horas, uh, então vai fazer algo afinal. So we get to do a little more. Once you operate on a, on a patient, that patient is yours, and you will the next day at like 5 in the morning, you're going to show up to the hospital and you're going to look up the, the, the data for that patient, the vital signs. You're going to examine the patient, ask the patient how he's doing, and then you're going to present that patient during rounds. So, when a visita, when vai passar a visita, é você que fala, na residente. Você vai falar, e o senhor José, é um homem de 105 anos, 
Apo, un, un, un día después de colestectomía, está tá, tá bom, está recuperando bom, no tiene dolor, no tiene náusea, uh, tiene constipación, no tiene tem, no gas, pero no tiene dolor, está todo bien. Y a, a ferimento está bom, no tiene señales de infección, cosas así. Você va a hablar, y surgeons and residents are going to ask a lot of questions of you, a lot, and you, you're going to need to know that. So they're, they're, it's a little different. So that's surgery. And then the rest, neurology, psychiatry, are very similar to medicine. You, you work at the infirmary for neurology. You work at the infirmary for, uh, and you do a little bit of outpatients as, as well, OK? So that's third year. Now at the end of third year, third year is the toughest year for us. Uh, you, you, we probably work 14, 15-hour days, I think, pretty solid, most rotations. Um, It's the toughest, the hardest year. Then you go to fourth year, okay? After third year, sometime in fourth year, you have to take step two, okay? Step two is a two-step, is a two-part exam. It's got a practical part and a written part. So the written part is nine hours, and you just computer. Step step one is eight hours, so, <laughs> and then the. Step two is, is, is nine hours, and then the practical part is 12 hours. Um, so you're going to take it at some point during this step, and I'll tell you more about it in, in, in a little bit. I, I, actually, I'll tell you about it now because I decided to take it as soon as I finished third year. I took it, I finished third year uh, in April, and in May, uh, which is, you see how this is red, so this is all fourth year already. Right here in May, I took the month of May off and I took step two. Um, so the practical exam is basically you see 12 patients, in a, fake patients, or actors, not fake patients, actors. Uh, in a little clinic, you get 30 minutes. Uh, you're supposed to see the patient, uh, get the history, get the exam, and come out of the uh, uh, room and type up a note in 30 minutes. Um, and then the patient, the, the actor, grades you on your language skills. So that's where foreigners have a little bit of trouble. So you, you, you got to practice your English because step two practical side actually was only for foreigner students when it was first created because it was a test meant to, 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 it was an exam meant to test language skills. It's $1,200, $1,200. So now they make us take it too because that's very good money. <laughs> I shouldn't be saying this on camera, but uh, it's a lot of money and it's just like, okay. Um, so they'll grade you on your language skills and on your personality, you know, were you cold or were you nice to the patient? Were you careful? Uh, there are people, the patient actually, the actor also says, has a list of things you have to do, certain, you know, does he listen to my heart, you know. Uh, did he ask me certain questions? Did he ask me if I had a fever, right? So if you don't do that, he won't, and then you lose points. It's, it's, not that, it's not as tough as it sounds. You will forget things. You come out of that room and you're like, damn, I didn't even ask him their age. Forgot to ask the age, you know? But it's fine. It's 12 patients. The, the, le the, the worst two grades dropped and you only get graded on 10 patients. So that's the practical exam. And the written exam is, again, just nine hours. How many blocks is it? Like eight blocks? Eight blocks in an hour off. Eight blocks, yeah. And then you get uh, an hour off that you take it as you want. So most of us take like five minutes between each block and spread it out. So that's step two. Um, then you go on to fourth year. Now, your sixth year is not our fourth year at all. It's very different. Fourth year for us is for the most part elective. You do what you want the whole year. At, at Harvard, there's only one required clerkship, one, un estadio mandatorio, que un estadio de clínica médica avanzada, un estadio, todos los estadios de cuarto año son llamados avanzados, porque el estadio de tercero año básico y el estadio de cuarto año avanzado, porque usted sabe un poquito más. Usted tiene que hacer un estadio de clínica médica o de pediatría. Si usted va para pediatría, va, va a escoger pediatría, si usted va, va para cualquier otra cosa, si usted va a ser cirujano, usted va, va a hacer clínica médica más, ¿cierto? 
the only thing that's required. After that, you do whatever you want for one month, one month at a time. You can't do the same thing. So just because I'm going to surgery, I can't do aparelo digestivo for seven months straight. That just defeats the point because the point of fourth year is for you to learn the things that you feel you need to learn to, your, to go to your thing. So what, just as an example, what did I choose to do? Well, here's the other caveat though. So, right, so fourth year starts May. Your applications for residency are due September. And in order to apply for residency, you need four letters of recommendation. If you're going to apply for surgery, you need four letters from surgeons. So you can't take a holiday May, June, July, and August. All right? Or you can't just do radiology and cardiology and, I don't know, some, just dermatology, just something, you know, because you need letters of recommendation. So it's elective, but you need to know how to structure it. So I did some surgical oncology for a month. I did vascular surgery for a month. I did uh, UTI, Unidad de Cuidado Intensivo, the Cirurgia, for a month. Uh, and I did my, uh, my, my clinical magic study também. Now, so these are very stressful months because these months, because they're advanced, they treat you, the, the, the goal is for you to act as a erhum, okay? And you have, you're much more responsible for patients. They expect you to know a lot more. They give you a lot more responsibility. It feels great because you feel a little bit more like, but you, you work a lot and you know you're working for that letter of recommendation. So, you know. Uh, you put your application together, you submit it in September. Interviews for residency happen November, December, January. So most of us take two months completely off. Just holiday. I took November, December. Not necessarily a holiday because I, I literally probably slept 10 days in my own bed in those two months. Because you just travel all over the country. Interviews. If you're applying to something like orthopedic surgery, which is very competitive, you're going to apply to like 50 programs. And then you'll get maybe 15 interviews and you're going to go to every single one of those interviews. Um, because it's very competitive. Dermatology, you're going to apply to 50 programs. Dermatology is very competitive. Very good lifestyle. Good hours. Lots of money. Yeah, good skin. So, uh, so it's those, those months are stressful too because you're in interviews trying to act your best and whatever, you know. Um, but, you know, uh, with October and then January, February, March, April, you again decide what you want to do. So the goal of those months is I want to go to surgery, right? I already did surgical oncology. I already did <coughs> vascular surgery. I'm not going to do the whole fourth year of surgery because that's what I'm going to do for my entire residency. So then that's when you think, you know what? As a surgeon, you need to know cardiology, right? Because if a patient starts having, so you do, I'm do a month in cardiology. Or you get a lot of infections, so you're like, you know, I'm gonna do a month with infectious diseases to learn a little more about antibiotics, about bacteria, you know? Uh, or you basically, again, that's the goal is for you to do things that are gonna helpful, that are gonna be helpful to you in your residency. And that's what you do here. You can do away electives. You can go to other hospitals in the country, or you can come to hospitals like, we can go, international electives, like what I'm doing. I, I did two months here, and these two months count for my fourth year. Eric is gonna do like two, two or something like that, and they're also part of his fourth year. Um, so it's, it's fun, and if you schedule it right, you, you, you can learn a lot. Um, whatever you learn here is what's gonna help you in the first year of residency. If you do nothing here, you're gonna suffer as a, as a Ehyun. Nos falamos interno para Ehyun, não para alunos de último ano. Ehyun é o interno e depois é um residente. Mas é um primeiro ano e é residente, é interno. Se você, se você fica fazendo coisas que são, que são tranquilas, né? estágios que são tranquilos, porque só seus colegas falam, é, você faz estágio de isto, você vai sair para casa às quatro da tarde, às três da tarde, é tranquilo. Você faz estágios desses, você vai chegar a interno e não saber nada. E você vai ser médico e vai ter pacientes e você vai ser responsável deles e vai matar alguém. Se é fácil. Então, é, precisa que você 
pense bem que o que vai fazer e, e que faz coisas úteis. Um, so that's that's med school in the United States. That's the fourth year. Uh, in March, you find out where you're going for residency. Um, May is actually off for, for me, it's graduation. In June, you start your residency somewhere. Um, residency is also a little different than it is here. So, one, one thing that's different. At the end of fourth year, you will have a degree as a doctor. Uh, you will have a diploma, but you don't have a license. Because notice, we, we haven't taken step three yet. So you don't have a license, so you cannot work as a doctor in the United States without a residency. Because your step three, you take it during the first or second year of your residency. Which is different than here. When you guys graduate, when Lucas graduates, Lucas can go off and work as a doctor and make money. You can't do that as as, as us. You have to, even as a, as a doctor that's going to work in a pronto socorro, or um, doc, um, um doctor que vai para um posto de saúde, Você tem que fazer mínimo três anos de, de residência no medicina familiar, medicina de família, ou medicina primária, ou medicina de emergência. Mínimo três anos tem que fazer você depois de faculdade para poder trabalhar. In step three, you'll take it in first or second year of, of residency. So foreign students, you're only required when you get to the United States to take step one and step two. That's it. And then. If you pass them, you'll be accepted for a residency, and then you'll take step three later on. Uh, very quickly, I'll tell you this. This is the new curriculum for Harvard. Year three, what's changing here is that years one and two are being compressed into one year. Okay? But we're not going to learn as anatomy, physiology, and pathophysiology. Now we're, we're going to learn based on systems. So we're going to learn the cardiac systems, anatomy, physiology, and pathophysiology all together. Okay? I think it's a better system. I, I, I envy the, my, the students that are this, they're going to be starting this year in August. They're going to start with this. So for one year they're going to do that. Then the second year they're going to go off to the hospital. So my third year is going to be their second year. Okay, and in their second year, they're going to do the hospital, and they're going to figure out what they want to do. Start getting an idea, I think I want to do medicine, I think I want to be a surgeon. And they come out in third year, and in third year, they're going to do selectives. So it's not going to be do whatever you want the way fourth year is. They're going to have a menu of things that they need to pick from, but they, they're going to be able to pick and kind of start start leaning towards something or exploring something that they want. And then fourth year right now is actually still up in the air, but I think it's going to be very similar to our fourth year right now. So this is going to be their system, still four years, nothing. You can see step one, they're going to take it at the end of third year. Step two, they're going to take it at midway through fourth year. Okay? So that's medical school in the United States. Everywhere, every medical school. Um, any questions on that, on the structure of medical school? Actually, uh, I just wanted to know, in the fourth year, can you choose how much time you're going to spend each subject? One month. All rotations are one month. Can you just repeat? Oh, yeah. So, the, so that's... The, right. So that was a, a good question. Is that she, she's asking, during fourth year, how, can you choose how long you spend at a certain rotation? All blocks are one-month blocks. And again, you can't do the same thing, right? So my buddy that wants to go into orthopedic surgery, if he wants to do a, a little bit of orthopedic surgery in the fourth year, what he can do is he can do a month of orthopedic trauma and a month of orthopedic oncology. Well, different, different things, but it's very similar. When you do international electives is when you can push it. So I did two months of just pronto socorro. My, you know, you're going to a different country, so they, they're a little lenient. But while well, you're there, it's one month only. Um, I did forget to mention something that, that Lucas wanted me to talk about. So something that's very common in medical schools all over the country, and in my school is very common as well, is people stopping after third year and taking a year off. Okay? More than half my class took a year off after third year to do another degree, so maestrado, O mais comum é maestrado em administração de negócio, 
na MBA, um mestrado na saúde pública, um MPH, um mestrado em política, em policia, eh, public policy, políticas públicas, coisas assim. Um, there are people, a lot of people, not a lot of people, but significant people, that are actually either accepted to med school already with this plan or during med school applied to do an MD, PhD. So they'll stop, they actually will stop after second year and go off to do research for four or five years, however long. Uh, if you're doing research in basic sciences, you know, like some like molecular or something like that, you, those take time. So they'll be gone for five years and then they'll come back and they'll do third year and fourth year and then they'll graduate, they'll be an MD, PhD and they'll probably be much more focused in research when they practice. Um, but again, more than half my class took a year off after third year. Some people are doing research as well. You can do one year of research as well. Why is that important? Because if you're applying to plastic surgery, you got to have some research in plastic surgery, significant research in plastic surgery. If you're applying to dermatology, it certainly helps if you have significant research. At Harvard, research is required. The summer, this summer, between first and second year, we have to do research for three months. But it's only three months. Not enough to, to, to make yourself competitive for something like orthopedic surgery or... You know. A lot of us do research through med school. So I did research through first year and second year. Just while going to school, you do research. Whatever. Some people choose to just take a year off to third year. Okay? So lots of people actually finish med school in five years, even six years. They're actually very flexible, at least in my, my school. As long as you're doing something that's academic, that's, you know, uh, they'll let you take time off, it's fine. And it doesn't have to be basic science. If you want to study health outcomes, if you want to start health disparities, if you want to go to an underserved community, poor people, and try to help, it's all fine. They call it scholarly endeavors. So anything that's scholarly, that's academic, they'll support you. They'll find funding, they'll give you money and stuff like that. And then whenever you're ready, you come back and you do your fourth year. Okay? So that's very good. So a lot of people at, in the United States graduate with dual degrees. MPA, MD, MPH, MD, MPP, MD, MBA. Very common. Okay? So that's med school. Again, um, so no, no other questions on that structure? Uh, you said that all medical schools are very tied to their problems. Yeah. But Harvard has just changed. Right, right. The other universities are more similar to the best formula? Right. So the, the question is, uh, you know, he, he's mentioned that I said that the, the, the med schools are regulated very tightly in the United States. So Harvard just changed what, are, what do other med schools look like as far as the curriculum. So I would say there are a few different styles of med school, okay? Some med schools have, there are two different ways of doing, taking classes, longitudinally or block-based. So what does longitudinally mean? I think that's the way you guys do it. You take multiple courses. You take in cardiology, neurology, and hematology, all at the same time. And you have, you have midterm exam, or week, right? For a week, you have the midterm for all those things, right? That's the way um, undergrads are, are, that's the way it is. You take three, four classes in undergrad at a time, and you have finals week, you know, where you have finals for all these things. So some med schools in the United States have longitudinal systems where they do multiple courses for, for you know, not necessarily organ system, but they'll do immunology or something like that at the same time. Or block-based, the way we were. We take physiology at a time. And we, in physiology, we do one week of cardiology, one week of renal, one week of that, you know. We are going to a... Um, still a block-based system, but it's now systems-based, right? But it's still block-based. So I would say that's the main difference, you know, whether it's block-based or longitudinal, where you take multiple courses. Now, we are taking multiple courses at the same time, but again, the afternoon courses are a little bit different in that they're the types of courses like health policy, like medical ethics. Um, so they're more on the, on the social aspect of medicine than the 
biological and physiological side of medicine, okay? So we do take courses at the same time in the afternoons, but they're different kinds of courses. So you do have more than exam exams for more than one class, um, but not in the, st the, way, the same way you guys have, you know? So that's the difference. Now this is also not, there are a few other universities, uh, Duke University, uh, University of Pennsylvania that have curriculums like this that are very compressed. So get the basic stuff very early, get the people into the hospital very quickly. Few, I would say three, four programs in the nation. Um, I think a lot more programs are going to start doing that because here's, here's the problem. After third year, sometimes you still don't know what you want. You finish third year and you're still like, uh, you know, on paper, Fourth year is supposed to be electives for you to explore. But it's not because you have to apply for residency in September. So you have four months to explore. But then you also have four months to actually do very important clerkships till you get the letters of recommendation. So a lot of people take a year off after third year because they don't know what they want to do. So they'll go off, do research, give themselves a little more time to, to figure it out. So I like this, this system. You know, get people into the hospital in second year, give them a little more time to explore in third year. By the time they get to fourth year, they'll really know what they want to do. Um, so yeah, um, any other questions? Okay, so I guess the next thing I wanted to address, that's med school, uh, is the step exams. I know a lot of people are interested in, in taking them. This is what I did to study for the step exam. That was literally my, my study uh, habits. Um, Eric, I'm sure, knows these, these names, but Eric might have done more or less or used different books. There's just a bunch of books. The, this is an industry that makes a lot of money, people that make review books, okay? And people go crazy and they buy all these books. They take a Kaplan course for $1,200, for $1,500, you know? They may be useful. If you're, if you're a foreign student, it may be useful because it gives you a little... It, it, it gets you used to the way America, you know, English questions are asked or formatted and it, it gives you some time to practice English a little bit. I still don't know that they're fully required. I think you can still just take your own time and do some of these books, okay? So this is what I did. Are you guys familiar with First Aid? You heard of First Aid? First Aid is a series of books, very popular. I think every med student studies that book. It's review. So it's a book this thick all the systems. If you know every word in that book, you ace the step. Everything you need to know, it's in that book. But it's summarized, it's bullets. It's like boom, 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 you know? So if you don't, I started studying for med, I started studying for my step two in uh, January. So most med students take about three months at least. Well, I lie, at Harvard, some people take like six months. They start studying like crazy here in October. Most of us start, you know, a lot of us start studying in January, kind of give ourselves three months. Med students at other universities just study for like a month or two. But we're kind of neurotic at Harvard, I gotta say. And then everyone, every, every year they keep starting earlier because you just like, you always feel you're late and so you're going to start one month and it's just a vicious. At some point people are going to come in and just start studying for this. You see first years carrying the first aid book and you're like, come on, just have fun, enjoy life, this is crazy. <laughs> Anyways, first aid, it's a review book. So what happens, right? I started studying in January. Pathophysiology for cardiovascular. I start, uh, we took it September, right? So I didn't remember it in January anymore. So, if you don't remember the system, First Aid has another book that's called First Aid Organ Systems. It's a thicker book. It's, a, it's like a full medic, medical textbook, okay? So, it's, one chapter is 70 pages. So, you'll take that chapter and you just browse it very quickly. Four hours. You sit down, you're just like boom, 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 kind of refreshing the, the material. And things start coming back. Then you go to this, this review book. Okay, this review book is maybe 15 pages for a system. Again, everything that's important, everything you need to know. And you hit that. 
what I did after that is I made some flashcards. So you read the review book, either go straight or you go through Oregon Systems first, read the review book, and I made some flashcards in my phone. I don't like paper flashcards because then you can have it on the phone the whole time, right? Then you, there's another book, it's called Pathoma. Pathoma is only pathophysiology, things that go wrong. It's a book that's this thick, very tiny. It's, it's made by a, a, a doctor in the University of Chicago, and he also made videos for the chapters, great videos. He says things in a way that you just understand it. Okay, so you, you watch those, I watched those videos, read the chapter, and I added some more information to my flashcards, fixed some information, edited my flashcards. Once you finish that, for me, that was, the, that was it. That was the material for, card, for card, cardiovascular, right? Then there are cue banks, question banks. So these are just programs that have nothing but questions, thousands of questions. The two main ones are Kaplan and USMLE World. Some people don't like Kaplan. Kaplan is not necessarily the most similar to the actual exam. It focuses in a lot of details, small details. But what's good is because it focuses in a lot more details, it teaches you a lot. So what I did is after I finished the chapter in first aid and I finished the chapter in Pathoma and I had some flashcards, I would do the chapter in QBank, the cardiovascular section of QBank, 250 questions. Do take several exams, questions you get wrong, it explains to you, it, ex it gives you a very detailed explanation uh, of the question, right? So then I would add more information to my flashcards and at the end of that, I would never go back to these books for the most part. Everything I need, I, it's on my flashcards. And I was just in the bus, wherever you're at, just doing your flashcards, okay? And you do that for every chapter. Um, it's very daunting. And it's very, it's very anxiety provoking, okay? When you first sit down, even as a med student in the United States, like you just studied all these things like right here. And you sit down and you see first aid and people tell you, you just have to know every letter in that. And you're like, what? And you start taking the, you start taking the, the Q banks and you suck. You are getting like 40%, 30% and you're just like, oh, I'm going to flunk this thing. I'm never going to be a doctor. <laughs> it's very anxiety provoking. The first, I would say, a solid month. You just don't understand how in the world you're going to be able to memorize all this, okay? So I want to tell you that to tell you that you're going to experience the exact same thing. If you decide to take the step, particularly coming from a different country, know that for the first month or the first two months, you're going to feel like it's impossible. But it's not. It's very much doable. There comes a point when you've done cards and you did respiratory, Right, the heart and lungs have a lot in common. So you've studied one in cars, you didn't understand it, but now you see it from the lung side of the house, and now you're like, okay, I'm starting to see it. And then the kidney, you know, has a lot in common, and some diseases affect the kidney and the lungs, and you're like, okay, now it's the third time I see the disease, and things start to fall into place, and it comes a time about the halfway through, month and a half, where you're just rolling, you're rolling. But it takes a while. I, I, I know I have, family members. I grew up in El Salvador in Central America. I, I, I came to the United States when I was 17. So my classmates from high school in El Salvador, a lot of them are, went to med school and they've come to the United States to take the step. Um, that, that sometimes they just stop. You know, you do it a couple months and you're just like, I can't do this and they'll come back or, you know, go study nursing or something in the United States. You know, you have, and you have doctors in Brazil that would have been great doctors in, the America, in, in America, but they get. So don't let it get to you. Just keep at it. Know that at some point you're going to hit a peak and it's just going to like just avalanche after that, okay? But it is daunting. Um, when you finish the first aid book, you finish all the systems and you finish the Kaplan QBank and you've got your flashcards, now you do USMLE World QBank, okay? That QBank is very similar to the test. And now you just, every day you just do questions. Every day, all day, for like tw solid 12 hours. Those three months are like no life, no daylight, no partying, no nothing. You just 
study. And you just do, do exams every day, questions. Um, you do it mixed, whichever way you want to do them, and you hit up your flashcards. At least that's what I did. That's what I did. And then the NBME, which is the organization that administers the exams, they actually have practice exams. So these are exams that are actual questions that were in the exam past years, okay? And they give it to you, they sell it to you for like $75 or something like that. Uh, half the length. So instead of eight hours, it's only four hours. You want to take those. Because those give you an idea of where you're going to be scoring. Okay? And if you're scoring too low, then it's no problem. If you had your, sa if you had your, your test scheduled for three weeks from now and you're scoring low, then you push it back. It's better to push it back. Take it once, only once. You can, you can take it multiple times, but you want to take it only once. Get a good grade. No one cares if you studied for a year or if you studied for two months. No one is going to know, right? Take it when you're ready to take it. When you're hitting good grades on those practice exams, when you're getting good grades on the World Q Bank, then you take it, you know. I should be able to ask you how much you're going to get on the exam and you should be able to tell me. I, you should be able to be like, yeah, I think I'm going to get about a 220. 225, because that's what I'm getting in these exams. If you tell me, I don't know, man, some days I get a 200, and some days I get a 230, so I'm just going to pray that that day is going to be a good day. That's not, you want to take it when you go confident. It's like it's just another practice exam, okay? So that's what you do. And then you take your step, and then you took one, and then you got step two to take. Which is a little bit easier because once you did all this studying, step two, you could literally take it a month later. Three weeks later for all that matters. Material is very similar. Except because we take step two after third year, step two is a little bit more, okay, how do you manage this? Not what's the diagnosis. Well, what do you do then? What's the medication? You know, ABCs and stuff like that for surgery, you know? So not, well, is it appendicitis? Okay, what do you do? Antibiotics, do you operate now? Do you operate later? So step two is a little bit more of management. But you guys, after graduating from here, you're gonna, step two, you're gonna know it. I mean, you're gonna be doctors at that point. So step two is a lot easier than step one. Step one is taking you back to first year and second year and third year, you've obviously forgotten it. So um, step two is gonna be a lot better. And then the practical one, it's fine. These are patients you've seen in Pronto Socorro a thousand times, okay? So you know what to do, just you know, speak slowly, get your English straight, and you'll be fine. We need doctors in the United States. We need, we need doctors, we want doctors, okay? So, it, trust me. Um, so that's, that's basically it, that's all I wanted to talk about. Um, any questions about the STEP exam? Oh, I, I do have one, not, not about the STEP exam, but mm. uh, do foreign students also need uh, the letters of recommendation for Yeah. Yeah. So the application for residency is the same. What taking step one and step two does is it allows you to apply for residency. But then you have to get yourself exposure to a hospital. I don't know exactly how to go about that. I think it's more like you, you reach out to a hospital, maybe you know someone, and you reach out to, to a hospital and say, hey, I'm a foreign student. I, I took my step one, step two, I'm, I'm ready to go. I'd love to do Eu quisiera hacer un estadio electivo de cardiología en no el hospital. I don't even think you need step one and step two. You can probably, I mean, you could do that right now if you wanted to, you know. But you don't want to do it too early. You want to do it more, you know, so right around the time, probably after you take the steps, it's even better. And you go and you do a, a rotation for a month in a hospital, and you try to develop a relationship, get your letter, and then you do another one, you get your letters, and then you put your application together. Um, can you get a letter from someone here? I'm, yeah, I, I don't see why not. Like, if you worked at a pronto cojo here for a year before you went to the United States and you were an actual doctor and your boss can write you a letter, like your, your, your o chef de divisão, uh, o professor pode escrever uma, uma, uma carta de recomendação. Eu acho que, eu acho que tá bom. Tem que ser uma carta em inglês. E então, o professor tem que falar inglês mais ou menos bem. Um, mas eu acho que tá bom. Pode ser uma carta aqui também. Mas 
você não quer ter uma carta de recomendação de, de há três anos. De uma coisa que você, você faz há... Você fez? Fez? Faz? Fez? Fez. Há três anos, há quatro anos. Tem que ser uma coisa mais recente. Então, mas se você tem... Há um ano você estava no Brasil e você trabalhou e, e você ficou bom. É? Pode pegar uma carta, mas precisa três ou quatro. Eu acho que quatro é melhor, mas você pode aplicar com três também. E tampouco queria aplicar com três cartas brasileiras, tampouco. Tem que ter uma coisa de Estados Unidos que para que eles, eles, eles sepam que você pode trabalhar no sistema americano, que você pode desenvolver no hospital de Estados Unidos. Né? Então tem que ter um avaliado, tem que ser avaliado por uma, uma pessoa de Estados Unidos. Mas você precisa também, a aplicação é o mesmo. Né? Um, when I was reading the first aid book, it said something that was different from one state to another. I state? Think, yeah, I don't know mm -hmm. what step was different. I think to apply for residency, do you know how it works? I don't, so I don't think so. So residency is, is a national thing. It's the, 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 the match is national, exactly. You guys have a different match. There's a different match system that's very similar to ours. Just like a different computer system to do your match for foreign students. Oh. But it's still national. Um, states have different licensing requirements uh, for the state license. Because there's like a national license, like you're a doctor license. So I'm, you know, I may, be a, I may have all step one, two, three, license to be a doctor, finish residency, I'm a surgeon, right? But I still need to apply for the license in Massachusetts oh, okay. or, you know, California or whatever, you know. I, so if I move, I can't just show up to California and start doing surgery. You know, I need to apply for, like, pay whatever fees because there's like some California Association of Surgeons that I need to feed, right? So that's maybe different. But for the most part, everything else is, is the same, I would say. So Louisa went to Boston last year. Ah. I used yeah. Harvard 2014. Hey, was it good? Yeah. yeah. I lived there when I was younger. And ah, there you it's go. Still, still great. <laughs> it's still, yeah, it's a great city. Boston is a great city. You should thank God you were not there this winter. Yeah. I thank God I wasn't there this winter. <laughs> it is the worst, worst winter in the history of Boston. Yeah. yeah. So I left the, the day that the, the storm started. I came here. <laughs> And then I went to Rio and stuff. Uh, any other questions about anything? Then? Uh, so, uh, Riga, regarding step one of your US um, what would you say is a reasonable score if you're looking forward to apply for a residence program yeah. in the US? So, the, that's a great question. Um, <coughs> the question is uh, what? what is a reasonable score in the step one to apply for a residency program? So, I, and I can tell you the averages. The national average is about 220, okay? Um, so I think if you score anywhere around that, you'll be fine. To, to tens, to thirties, to twenties, you know, that's about the national average. Um, from what I've heard from foreign students, from you know, my friends or family members that I've, that I've tried to do it, it's not easy to apply for an actual specialty, right? So say there are people um, that were orthopedic surgeons, like here in Brazil, right? They were actual orthopedic surgeons. You know, they're young because you can, you know, orthopedic surgery is how many years in residency here? Three, Three right? So uh, 18 plus 6, 24. Uh, three, oh, but this after general surgery, right? You do general no, surgery? Straight. No, straight, three years. Straight. All right, so you're, you're, you could be an orthopedic surgeon at 27, yeah. 28. So you show up to the United States at 29, you're still very young. You'd love to go to orthopedic surgery, obviously, right? You're gonna have to kill step one. You're gonna have to just go get a real high score. American students have to score about a two, in the 260s high 250s to 260s to apply to something like orthopedic surgery, okay? So you're going to have to score a lot higher. This is, an, I'm, I'm, this is a lot of personal assumption, okay? But um, United States needs primary care docs, okay? We have a huge need for primary care docs. So they would love if all foreign 
medical graduates go into primary care medicine because that's where the need is at. Okay, so if you want to do something more specialized, like surgery or orthopedic surgery or something else, you need to you need to get a good score. But to be a doctor and to get in and to get a to get an internal medicine uh, spot. 220 to 30 is fine, and then after internal medicine, certainly you can do, you can go into dermatology, or, no, derm is straight, I'm sorry, um, neurology, uh, that's straight too, sorry, um, cardiology, uh, nephrology, you can, these are fellowships, so, uh, subspecializations, uh, endocrinology, you want to work with, you know, diabetes and endocrine diseases, you can do that, certainly do that, but they want you to go to an internal medicine residency, or primary care residency, or family medicine residency. These are actually, primary care and internal medicine are sometimes the same. Some programs have actual different residencies for primary care versus internal medicine. Some have an internal medicine program, but different tracks. So you focus more on the internal medicine to be the doctor in the hospital. So we call it a hospitalist doctor. A doctor that only works at the infirmary or you focus more in being a doctor that's going to be primary care, so working in ambulatorio, mice. Uh, family medicine is certainly a separate residency program because in family medicine, you're taking care of adults and children. Okay? Primary care and internal medicine, it's only adults. You want to do children, you do pediatrics. Okay? Family medicine, it's presumed that you're going to be the doctor that anything walks through the door, you're able to take care of it. Okay? So those are the three kind of tracks that they would like for you to go, because that's where the need is at. Okay, so you kind of have to, you know, do your best in the in this course. But again, the score should not be a surprise. You should know what you're going to get from studying and from taking the practice exams. And if you're not hitting the score that you want to hit, then just keep studying and push the test back. Okay. Any other questions? You do, you do. Um, so, for residency, you, you, you have a salary, it's a national salary, adjusted by the cost of living of the different states, okay? Uh, but all residents in that state make the same, okay? So, the year of residence, is it the state or the hospital? No, the hospital, sorry, the hospital. Um, it is adjusted by the cost of living, but even within a city, different hospitals may pay differently. Okay, but there's a range that the American Association, not American Association, who controls that? Is it the AAMC? I have no idea. Some, some organization says this is the range where you can go. Um, so for my position, right, my surgery residency, you go to a place like um, Georgia in Atlanta, for example, cost of living is a little bit lower. So a first year resident will get paid about $49,000 a year, okay? Uh, in Boston, the cost of living is much more expensive. So you'll get paid maybe 57. That's, uh, that's about it, you won't get paid any more than that. And then every year, it goes up by a little bit. Um, remember, we do have big debts. Uh, med school's not free in the United States. Uh, uh, Harvard, the cost of tuition is about sixty thousand uh, dollars a year, just tuition, and then you cost of living. You got to add another about twenty, twenty-five thousand just to eat and pay rent and all that. So, uh, so a lot of people have scholarships. Uh, Harvard is very generous, very generous with how they help people that need help. So, Harvard doesn't give you any scholarship based on brain. They see everyone the same, but they only give scholarship based on need. So if your family makes under a certain amount of money, they will help you a lot to the point of just paying the whole thing for you. Um, and there are other universities as well that have very good scholarships, and there's always, always financial aid, but we do have debt to pay when we get out, so a lot of that salary goes into you know, paying back. Um, but you know, it's decent enough. Yeah. Any other questions? So just you just spent some weeks here at trauma surgery. Yeah. So just just briefly, how what 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 do you think about that? Your experience. Here? Yeah. Just briefly, what what was your experience and what do you think about it? 
so I, I loved it. I, I came, I got exactly what I wanted to get out of, out of coming here, which was I wanted to get much more experience and a little more independence as well, okay? So, yeah, I, as I said, in the OR, I think from what I've seen that us students, third and fourth year students, get to do more than fifth and sixth year students and maybe even first and second year residents. First and second year residents, you know, they, 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 they do the instruments a lot. So there we do a lot. Again, we, we close skin and stuff. We don't, we, we are very lacking when it comes to skills, related, like pronsococho type skills, uh, central lines, you know, cadet central, drenage de thorax, gasometria, because intubação, yeah. Sutura. When I came, I knew, I, knew how to, I knew how to suture, but it's not the same when you suture in an OR with a sterile field than when you're suturing somebody in the, in, in the ED. And so I wanted to get more experience with that, and I certainly got that. And so um, I think you guys, it makes sense to me why you're able to go work right after school. You have your, your hands-on skills are very good. Uh, my, my impression also of, your, of your, the theory is you, the residents and you guys are on point. On point means like you're, um, the residents know a lot. The first years and second years, at least here at surgery, uh, I was quite impressed. They're, they're great teachers um, and they know their stuff. They know their stuff. Um, so yeah, I enjoyed it very much. I, I, I got to do a lot with my hands. Uh, ATLS, so trauma, is something we focus a little more as a resident. So the first thing you, I'm going to do as a residency is to learn ATLS. We learn ABCDs in the, you know, it's a test, you have to know how to answer a test. But we don't have the experience that you guys have managing traumas. Because when you guys rotate the pronsococo as a six years, uh, you're at the 19 days, I think, or something like yeah. that, right? So, you know, 20 days, you're going to be there. You're going to know, you're going to know ATLS pretty well after those 19 days. As a fourth year med student, I don't know that I would feel too much, you know, that much comfortable with ATLA, but I, I, I feel a lot more comfortable now after having been here with you guys. So, uh, so there are differences. Um, it's, but it's, it's uh, you know, I think the, the system here works, um, you know, and it works, works well. I've enjoyed it. I mean, I, I'm very thankful that I, and, and, and really, really. Uh, and just briefly, the, the worst part? What do you think is the bad part of our system? <laughs> Just trade. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, the bad part, so Latin American countries all have the same problem. El Salvador has a lot of the same problems. You know, your, your, your health system here in Brazil is in, very way, in many ways like El Salvador. It's very, it's very fragmented. Um, there's a lot of socioeconomic differences. You've got your private hospitals that don't have macas laying in, in, in the corredor. Mas HC tem que ter macas no corredor. E se alguma pessoa fica internada na maca. Quando eu cheguei, eu, eu, eu falei, o que é isso? O que, o que essa pessoa está ah, internada? Não, nos Estados Unidos, não é a pessoa que está internada, fica internada no quarto. Que eu acho que também no mesmo é um hospital Albert Einstein, o um hospital uh, sírio-libanês, não. Então, o mesmo problema, no Salvador também. Ele tem muitas limitações de, por a situação econômica, situação política e corrupção e tudo isso, não. Uh, problema de educação. Minha, uma, uma coisa que, algumas coisas que, que, que eu observei, por exemplo, é, em alguma vez eu passei visita para um aluno de quinto ano, não? E o, uh, o cirurgião fala, é, quem conhece a história de paciente? E ninguém conhece. E isso não passa nos Estados Unidos. Alguns de vocês têm que, têm que conhecer esse paciente e têm que conhecer o paciente melhor que o resto de equipe, o resto de time. Porque se você se paciente de você, você tem que saber tudo. Por quê? Porque você tem três pacientes e o residente tem 15. Então, se o, o doutor pergunta, quais são as medicações desse paciente? O residente fala, você tem que saber. Ah, ele tem toma hidrocolortiza, ele toma este, ele tem hipertensão, ele tem alergia. Não, ele tem alergia a contraste, não podemos fazer tomografia, não. E, mas é porque as prestações que você vai ter nesse tipo de responsabilidade. E eu achei que aqui, e quando o cirurgião falava, ninguém sabe. Então também, 
É, nos Estados Unidos ninguém sabe história, então vocês todos vão ter uma mala avaliação, hein? Porque é um pouquinho mais de pressão, eu acho. Mas é, é vocês aprendem igual e, e, e saem de faculdade como excelentes médicos, então eu não vou falar aí. There's always é, né? room for improvement, right? There's always room for improvement, yeah. Maybe we're too, uh, maybe we're too tough. Um, There's one great thing that I saw that I saw here. Yeah, that, that you guys get along with your residents very well. So the resident-student relationship is very nice, very nice, very collegial, very like you know we joke around. Residents teach a lot, but they do it in a very relaxed way. In America, it's, it's, it differs. In, in surgery, it's a little, it's a little, it's a little rougher. It's a little rougher. Uh, so and I, you know, I, I like your guys' way. There's no need to to treat the student like uh, you know, like uh, you're such dumb, you know. And no, he's a student. You were there two years ago. Remember it, you know. Uh, so I do like the relationship you have. It's just uh, in some ways, uh, it's a little less less pressure. Again, uh, in surgery in the United States, I'll be at the hospital at five in the morning, and I'll probably leave around seven thirty at night. Uh, but that's because I need to see the patient before anyone else does. I, I don't know if that's the way it is in fifth year here, but maybe it is, I don't know. It depends on the... Depends on the thing, yeah, so... So, Numa, thank you very much. So, all this talk will be available at uh, the website, so if you want to spread the word and talk to other people. We're having a course here, the fourth, doing research in Boston as well. When we received the students from FMU, we went to Harvard School of Public Health to do, to do research last year and we'll talk to you how it is. We have some students actually from our alumni that did the USMLE all these steps so mm. now they can work there as surgeons as uh, clinicians there. So it's good if you are interested in that we can let you know who are these people. So Numa, you are very welcome here. Thank you for your for sharing your time with us. And uh, feel welcome to return here to Brazil and to University of São Paulo. Thank you okay? very much. Thank you. Se alguém quiser perguntar alguma coisa, fica à vontade. Valeu, Bruno. Obrigado. Obrigado, muito obrigado.